Hello everyone. Welcome to Lit Audio Hub. Let's start this video. When a person's life story is written by someone else, it is called a biography of that person. Thus, we can also say that a biography is simply the story of a real person's life. It can be about someone who is still alive, about someone who lived centuries ago, about someone who is famous on a world star, about an unsung hero whom history has forgotten, or even about a unique group of people. A biography includes facts of life from birth to death, or the author's present day, often keeping life-changing moments at the center. The author usually points out the events of the subject's childhood, coming of age, relationships, failures, and successes to create a comprehensive description of her subject. Sometimes we make some mistakes knowingly or unknowingly, which we regret later. When we make mistakes, we are not aware of this at all. This mistake can have an impact on our life in the future. Sometimes our excessive goodness also becomes the cause of our sorrow. We do not even realize that we are digging a pit for ourselves. These seven things of an intelligent person should never be told to anyone. Once upon a time, a young man lived in a city. The young man's family was very poor. There were fights in his family every day over some issue or the other. That young man was very upset with these fights. When that young man tried a lot to stop the family fight, but instead of stopping, the fights were increasing. So when the young man goes to people in search of work, people ask him, Brother, how much salary do you get? Then he tells them that you just give me a less salary. My family's financial condition is very bad. I need a lot of work. You just keep me on the less salary, and I will take as much as you want. So people take advantage of his helplessness and keep him on a lesser price because he himself gave people a chance. People knew that he needed a lot of work. He could work even on less money. And when that young man sits with his friends and relatives, even then he talks about his poverty. He tells his friends and relatives that what should I do? My family is very poor. We do not even get two meals a day properly. And every day there are fights in the family. I do not understand what should I do. His friends and relatives also. They listen to him. And after that, they all make fun of him and say that this poor man will remain poor and nothing can happen to him. And there is no love in his family too. Whenever you see them, they keep fighting with each other and they keep crying for no reason and do nothing themselves, whereas that young man was telling them his problem, considering them his own, so that people can help him, but no one helped him now. Wherever the young man goes, everyone despise him and call him poor. No one pays him the full value of his work. That young man works the whole day, but he gets only a few rupees. No one pays him the full amount of his hard work. If he says anything to them, then they say to him, If you want to work, then do it. Otherwise go away from here. Now that young man had to work, so he used to work slowly with time. The condition of that young man had become very bad. Everyone started using his time. Everyone had come to know that that young man is very poor. He cannot do anything to them, and if he needs money, then he will work. Then all the people of the town insult him by calling him poor poor. That young man got very upset with all these calls, and he was unable to understand what was happening to him. Then he heard people talking that a Buddhist monk had come to the town. That Buddhist monk has the solution to all the problems. That Buddhist monk is a very knowledgeable person. On hearing this, that young man also went to that Buddhist monk. That young man went to the Buddhist monk and said to him crying that Maharaj, why does everyone do this to me? Then, after listening to the young man, the Buddhist monk asked what happened, child. Then that young man starts crying loudly, and while crying tells his whole story to the Buddhist monk and tells him that Maharaj, everyone calls me poor, makes fun of me, and no one gives me the full earnings of my hard work. I work all day in their fields, and they pay me very little. My friends and acquaintances also make fun of me. That Buddhist monk listens to all the things said by that young man very carefully and asks him that how did all the people of the town come to know that you are very poor and why do people pay you such a low salary even after working the whole day? Hearing the Buddhist monk, the young man said that actually, Maharaj, to get sympathy from the townspeople, 
I told them that I am very poor, you should keep me on a low salary, I will take the salary. Hearing this, the Buddhist monk said, What is the fault of the people in this? If the people of the town make fun of you and pay you low salary, then it is your fault. You have encouraged those people, you should have kept some things limited to yourself only, but you told those things to everyone. Hearing the words of the Buddhist monk, the young man fell at his feet and started saying to him, Maharaj, what should I do now? Please solve this problem of mine. Hearing the young man, the Buddhist monk said, Look, what has happened now cannot be brought back, but today I will tell you such things which you should never tell anyone. Keep it limited to yourself only. Even if it is your friend or a relative, you should not tell these things. You should not tell anyone. After listening to the Buddhist monk, the young man said with great admiration, Tell me, Maharaj, what are those things that we should not tell anyone? Then the Buddhist monk said to the young man that the first thing that you should not tell anyone is the goal of your life, the dream of your life. What do we do? We tell our dreams to everyone that I will do this. I want to become this when I grow up. We feel that people will ask a lot of questions after hearing that how big a man do I want to become. People will praise me, but this does not happen. When we tell our dreams to people, then a sense of satisfaction comes in our mind. We are very happy with our mother, due to which we are not able to keep that passion for our dreams which we had earlier. When we tell our dreams to people, then their expectations from us increase. They start paying more attention to us, due to which sometimes we also get stressed, and then this stress creates balance in our life, and then we deviate from our dreams. When we tell our dreams to someone, then some people will inspire you, which will give you courage to move forward, but there are many people who, they will demotivate you and demotivate you, which can lead you to deviate from your goals. That is why, whatever your dream is, fulfill it, and only then, tell it to others. If you tell them beforehand, then people will create obstacles, and if you fulfill your dream quietly, then people will automatically know which dream you have achieved. That is why never tell your dream to anyone, never tell your goal. Then the Buddhist scorpion told the young man that the second thing which you should not tell anyone is our problems, our troubles. What do we do? Like we have a problem. If we have a problem, then we immediately reach out to people for its solution. They start listening to our sorrows, but telling our problems to other people means creating another problem for ourselves, because when we tell our problems to someone, then we feel very good, we feel as if our sorrow has gone a little bit. But all the people do not reduce our problems, rather they increase them and create many problems in front of us. Out of all the people with whom we tell our problems, 70% of them are such who do not care about our problems, rather they make fun of us, and 20% of the people are happy to know this, and 10% are such people who have a little problem. It can make a lot of difference how much we are troubled, but the difference does not mean that they will support you. When people make fun of our problems, we feel very sad. That is why we should never tell our problems to anyone. We should find out their solution ourselves because no one knows us better than us, and we can get out of every problem without anyone's help. Then the Buddhist monk tells the third thing to the young man, that we should never tell our family problems to anyone. There is definitely some problem in all of our families where everyone lives together, no matter where we are, whether our relations with our family are good or bad, we should not tell anyone. When we tell others about it, people listen to you with fun. It does not matter to them what problem you are in. Rather, they will try to take advantage of those weaknesses. You should solve your family problems by talking to your family members among themselves, then you will not need to tell others. And when we tell our and our family's problems to people, then people make fun of us. People start considering me weak. People start thinking about us that he will not be able to do anything. He will not be able to take care of his family. If he is getting worried on such small things, then how will he face big problems in life in future? We tell people about our family problems thinking that they can help us, but this world is very selfish. No one is special to you in this world. People listen to us with great interest, and in front of us they show false sympathy. 
and then whatever we tell them behind our back, they spread it all around with a lot of exaggeration due to which nothing happens to those people. But your family's respect gets ruined. People start making all kinds of stories about your family. They start saying hundred things about one thing. They tell even that thing which did not happen with exaggeration. In this world, there are less people who apply ointment on the wound, and there are many people who sprinkle salt on it. That is why you should never tell anyone about your family's condition. Fourth thing is never tell anyone about your wealth. Then the Buddhist monk told the young man the fourth thing and said that you should never tell people in front of them what things you own or what you have. You just tell people that you have so many bungalows, so many cars, so much wealth, so that people can know, but you are not telling them thinking that you are trying to show them down. But people can take your words in the wrong sense. They can think that you are saying all these things to show them down, and then they will start hating you. At that time, they will not say anything, but inside, they will start hating you and will start staying away from you. They will try to bring you down, and it is possible that after listening to your words and knowing that you have so much wealth, some people make false relations with you. They can also get their work done from you. There are many selfish people in this world who build relationships with people just to get money. That is why you should not tell anyone about your wealth. Nobody knows the game of time. If today is good, then it is not necessary that tomorrow will also be good. Suppose you have a lot of wealth today. But if you do not have it and you ask for help from people, then people will not help you. Rather, they will taunt you and say that you had so much wealth. Where did the money go? Did you tell the truth? Or did you keep singing lies and we should not tell people about our wealth? Because there are many people in this world who do not even have clean water to drink. They drink dirty water. They do not even have two meals a day. Whereas you have everything. That is why never show off your wealth in front of people who are poorer than you. If possible, help them. Fifth thing. Never tell anyone the secret of your success. Then the Buddhist monk told the young man the fifth thing and said that never tell anyone the secret of your success. It is not wrong to tell how we have achieved success. If a person learns from it and moves forward, then it is a very good thing. But what most people do is that they start walking on the path shown by us, and if they fail after following the path shown by us, then they start blaming us, whereas we had done good for them, but they start considering us guilty and say that I wish I had not come under his influence, he showed me the wrong path, whereas the same way of success is not enough for everyone. It is not necessary that they also get success in the same way in which you have become successful. That is why never tell anyone the secret of your success. If that person really tries to know the path of success from you, and he is very dedicated to the work, and he is very determined that no, I have to do this work, then you can definitely tell him, but you should never tell anything to anyone in future. Otherwise, if they fail, then they will start blaming you. It does not matter to those people that you are doing good for them. If he fails, he will start hating you. He will start speaking ill of you. That is why never tell anything to anyone. Sixth thing, do not boast about the help given by you. Then the Buddhist monk told the young man another thing and said, If you help someone, then do not bring your help in front of people because there are many poor people in this world who need our kindness and charity. But if you help those poor people so that people praise you and people see you in a good light and you become famous in the society, then never show off like this. You should not help people so that others praise you. Rather, you should help people with a true heart without telling anyone because this help gives you peace from within. When you help a needy person, then you feel a different kind of joy inside. But if you help a needy person just for show, then for some time, you will become good in the eyes of others, but you will never be able to get self-satisfaction. Seventh and last thing, do not mention your income in front of others. Then the Buddhist monk told the young man the seventh and last thing and said, never mention your income in front of others, because this is such a thing which we always keep limited to our family. Never tell your friends or relatives about your income. We should never ask anyone about their income, nor tell them about our income. Because when we tell people about our income, people easily find out about our status, which is not right for us at all. Because if our income is less, 
and we tell people about it, then people consider us poor and start staying away from us, start insulting us, start insulting us, start considering us as a traitor, do not respect us. If our income is more and we tell people about it, then people start maintaining relationships with us for their own benefit. They are not interested in us, but in our money. People will not develop relationships with you because you are a good person. Rather, they will develop relationships with you because you have money. People who do not like you will also develop relationships with you because of your money and will behave with you as if you are very special to them. That is why never tell anyone about your income. Just keep it limited to yourself and your family, because only your family is happy to see your progress. The rest of the world is not interested in your progress. The young man, who was among those who were jealous after seeing this, understood very well everything said by the Buddhist monk, and at that very moment, he resolved in his heart that from now onwards, he would never reveal his secrets to anyone. After this, the young man bowed to the Buddhist monk and then went away from there. So friends, what did you learn from this story? There are many such stories from which you can learn a lot and move forward in your life. So let us understand from the second story. It is said that mother is the most powerful thing in the world. If you take something from your mother, then you can achieve it. I do not say this, all the great men say this, but if this is true, then why do we not get what we want from our mother? Brother, no person would want sadness in his mother, but she is unhappy. Every person wants to be successful from his mother, wants to earn a lot of money, but still, he does not succeed. Who would be such a person in the world who would want his mother to be unsuccessful or not earn money? It is a matter of thinking, then two things come out in this. Either those great men were wrong who said that the thing desired by the mind is achieved, or we are wrong. In the story that I am going to tell in today's post, you will get such a mantra to understand it. Later you will get to know such a mantra by which you will be able to understand that how anything can be done by your mind, how anything can be sown in the mind, you will understand this very well from this story, and through this, you will also be able to understand how the law of attraction works. The story is short but very deep. You will be able to take full advantage of this story only if you watch this video till the end. So let's start the story and understand how to control the mind with the mantra of the mind. Once upon a time, there was only sorrow in a man's life. Whatever work he did, that poor man's work was never completed. When he came home, there was always a quarrel in the house. If someone asked for help from someone, no one helped him. It seemed that a mountain of sorrow had fallen on him from all sides. He was unable to understand how to get rid of these sorrows. He was thinking day and night about how to get rid of his sorrows. Due to this, he could not even sleep at night. Big circles had formed under his eyes, which were a symbol of how sad and worried that man was. Sometimes he even thought of committing suicide, but he could not take this decision by worrying about his family. He became so sad that he decided that he would get rid of these sorrows. For this, no matter how much hard work he had to do, no matter what he had to do, even if he had to walk on embers, he would get rid of these sorrows. One day, he asked his friend how he could improve his life. His friend told him that he should go to some Baba. Baba has such a mantra which removes all the sorrows. Life is filled with happiness, and wealth is also acquired. You should find such a Baba. Your work will be done. This thing was completely sure in the mind of that man. She thought that only a Baba can remove my sorrow, and that is why if she came to know about any Baba, she would reach Baba and tell him her problem and ask him for its solution and say that Baba, I am ready to do anything, but please free me from these problems. I will do whatever you say, but please improve my life. Baba used to tell her some black magic tricks to do and in return, used to take donation, that after doing this black magic trick, there will be peace and happiness in your house. Just do this trick, with complete method. That man returned home, and started doing black magic tricks, with complete method. But even after doing a lot of black magic tricks, there was no change in his life. On the contrary, his life became more sad. Whichever Baba used to give him black magic tricks, 
he used to take donation from him in return, due to which his wealth was also getting finished slowly. Due to this, the sorrow in his life increased more. Then he felt that by going to Baba, instead of reducing the sorrow in my life, it is increasing. So what should I do? Should I go to Baba or not? Then one day, a man he was told that you should call a pandit to your house and get a Havan done. After the Havan, the house will be purified. If there is any negative energy in the house, it will go out of the house. Call a pandit and get him to perform the Havan with full rituals and chant mantras, so that there is peace and happiness in the house. This thing sat well with the man, and he called a pandit to his house and got the Havan done. The Havan was completed well. In return, the pandit also took a good donation, and after that, he left from there. But after a few days, that man realized that there is still no change in his life. Now that man became completely sad and became more upset. Now he started feeling that the sorrows in my life will never end, and thinking this, that man's condition became bad. Then one day he came to know from his friend about a Baba who did not take any donation for giving solutions. The man thought that this Baba cannot be like other Babas, because he does not take donation, and if he does not take donation, then he must be a true Sita Baba, and thinking this, he goes to Baba. When the man reaches there, the Baba was sitting in meditation. Seeing this, the man sat there quietly and waited for him to come out of meditation. After a little fear, Baba opened his eyes and saw a sad and troubled young man sitting in front of him. Seeing the dark circles under his eyes, he understood how much this man is troubled with his life. Addressing him, Baba asked, Child, what do you want? What have you come to take from Baba? The man said, Baba, I am very troubled with my life. I have tried many ways to remove these sorrows. I have tried every trick that any Baba told me to do. I have done everything that any person told me to do. But there has been no reduction in sorrows in my life. On the contrary, there has been an increase in sorrows in my life. I do not understand. I am thinking, what should I do? Sometimes I think of committing suicide, but thinking about my family, I do not take this step. I have heard a lot about you, Baba, and I have come to you with a lot of hope. Please show me a way through which I can get rid of my sorrows. I am ready to do anything to get rid of my sorrows. Whatever path you show me, no matter how difficult that path is, I will cross it. Baba felt that the man was really very troubled. Baba, after listening to him, said that child, mantras to remove sorrows are not found just like that. Mantras have to be done for oneself. You can do something. Hearing this, at first the man thought that this Baba will also ask for donation from me, but there was no other way. The man said, Baba, I am ready to give whatever donation you want, but your mantra should be true and should be complete. I should get its fruit. After that, I will give you whatever donation you want. Baba said, Donation is a very small thing. I don't want that. On this, the man thought and said, Baba, I am ready to walk even on embers. You just give me permission. Baba said, I am not going to make you do this small thing of walking on embers. What I am going to make you do is a very difficult mantra. Will you be able to complete it? He said, Baba, you tell me what I have to do. I am ready to do anything. On this, Baba told him that when you go to your home from here, then on the way, keep repeating to your mother that I am happy. I am happy. Repeat this to your mother again and again, and remember this should not come on the tongue. This has to be repeated only to the mother. On hearing this, the man said, Baba, that is all. I will do this in a snap of my fingers. But what will happen by this? Baba said, Try this mantra. Anyway, you have done mantras of so many Babas, so try this mantra also. The man thought that Baba is not taking any donation, and it is a small mantra. I will do it anyway. He said, Okay, Baba, I will definitely do this mantra. And saying this, the man started walking from there, but as soon as he started walking, Baba said from behind, Child, remember one thing. When you repeat this mantra in your mind, 
then the thoughts of monkey should not come to your mind. The thought of monkey should not come. Only then this mantra will be successful, the man said. Till date, no thought of monkey has come to me. So why will it come now? You don't worry, Baba. I will just repeat this to my mother that I am happy. I am happy. Apart from this, no thought of monkey will come to my mother, saying this. The man leaves from there. He keeps repeating to his mother, I am happy. I am happy. He had just walked away when suddenly the thought of a monkey came to his mind. The thought of the monkey came once and went away. But the man thought that till today no thought of a monkey had come to his mind. Why did the thought of a monkey come today? And by doing this, he caught the thought of that monkey and forgot what mantra he had to repeat, and he started thinking about the monkey. When he regained consciousness after a while, he again started repeating the same mantra which Baba had told him, I am happy, I am happy. But suddenly he saw a monkey, and seeing this, the thought of the monkey again arose in his mind, and seeing this, he wanted to throw this thought out, and he wanted that the thought of the monkey should not come in his mind in any way, but he saw only a monkey in front of him. Struggling like this, he reached home, and after reaching home he told his wife, O oh monkey, serve me a monkey for dinner. And when he realized what he had said, he started shaking his hair and banging his head against the walls, thinking that till date I had not had any thought of a monkey. And today, what has happened to me that I am seeing monkeys everywhere? What kind of illusion is this, thinking this? The man could not sleep the whole night, kept turning from side to side the whole night, and after waking up in the morning, he went straight to the same Baba and fell at his feet and said, Baba, I don't know what miracle is happening, till today I never thought of a monkey, but since yesterday when you told me that I should not think of a monkey, I am seeing monkeys everywhere. That man said, Baba, I can see a monkey sitting on the tree behind you eating bananas. What is happening, Baba? Hearing this, Baba started laughing. Yes, 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 child. Mother's dal is such a dal that it is not so easy to understand. Monkeys used to come in your way earlier also. When you came to me, these monkeys were roaming on these trees, but at that time these monkeys were not in your mind. Then you were only thinking about sorrow. After this, Baba told him that child, the thing from which we want to run away, the same thing enters very deep in our mother and gets absorbed in our inner mind. Actually, the thing from which we want to get rid of, we want to get rid of it because it is very deeply connected with us, and the more we want to get rid of it, the deeper it gets settled in our mother, and finally it gets absorbed in our inner mind. On the surface, we want to be happy that I am happy, I am happy. Our lips also keep saying this, but there are times of sorrow in our mother. In our thoughts, we see only sorrow in our mother. That is why by repeatedly saying with our tongue that I am happy, I am happy, we will not be happy until this mantra does not enter our inner mind. On this, the man asked that Baba. But this mantra, hearing how it will enter our inner self, Baba said that child, stop fighting with your sorrows. As long as you keep thinking about removing your sorrows, those sorrows will remain hidden from you and will keep ruling your inner self. And the day you stop thinking about those sorrows, you will not want to get rid of them. From that day onwards, sorrows will disappear from your life, because to get rid of anything, we have to think about that thing, and the more we think about that thing, the deeper it enters our mind. Conclusion Most of the time we think about sorrows. We think that there is sorrow in our life, and we have to get rid of it. Because of this, by thinking again and again, those sorrows enter into our inner mind, and we do not even realize it. That is why if you want to get rid of sorrows, then stop thinking about getting rid of sorrows. You will get relief from sorrows. Often a person wants to quit smoking, wants to quit alcohol, promises himself in the morning that he will not do any wrong thing, but when he returns in the evening, he returns drunk. Why does this happen? We are not fulfilling what we are thinking. In fact, we are giving too much importance to that thing. We are giving too much significance to that thing. Whenever we think about leaving that thing,
then we increase its importance, i.e., its speciality even more. The more our mind thinks about that thing, the more our mind thinks about quitting alcohol or smoking, the more our mother will run after that thing. We do not have to fight that thing, but go through it without thinking, and if we understand this mantra, then whatever we want to achieve in our life, we can put it in our inner mind, and once that goal sits in our inner mind, then there is no problem in success. There is no problem. So friends, how did you like this story? Tell us by commenting and share this video as much as possible. Thanks friends. Today in another video we will talk about the believe system. Friends, if you believe in yourself, believe in yourself. This is the biggest power in the world and you can achieve whatever you want in your life by believing in yourself. Friends, that boy also had a challenge. There was a crisis, but he did not leave the side of positivity. Wherever you are in life, wherever you are in crisis, whatever situation you are in, if you never leave the side of positivity, then believe me, you will get him out of the crisis. Friends, this story is about a handicapped king in whose kingdom there was no problem or there was no problem. All the people were very happy with that king and thanked God for sending such a good king in their life. That king was handicapped, he was missing one eye and the other, but still the king did not have any regrets about this. One day the king was roaming in the corridor of his palace and looking at the picture of his ancestors and was thinking that my father was such a brave man, his father was such a brave man. We got a chance to be born in such a brave family. I am very thankful to God. The king reached the last picture. After looking at all the pictures and then seeing the empty space, he got worried because he knew that now whatever picture will be put here will be his, but the king was not worried about this. He was worried about how the painting that will be put up there will look. The king was worried because he did not have one eye and one leg. He was worried because he did not have one eye and one leg. He started thinking that there is such a wonderful painting in this corridor, but because of my one eye and one leg, my picture will look the worst and will look ugly. The king thought that after I do it, I don't know what kind of painting will be made, and why not get a wonderful painting made while I am alive, so that I get peace, that my good painting will be put up here. Now it was announced in the kingdom, and all the painters were called, and it was said that whichever painter makes a wonderful painting of the king will get a wonderful reward. Now all the painters came to the kingdom. All those painters knew that if a wonderful painting is made, they will get a wonderful reward. But the king does not have one eye and one leg. How will his wonderful painting be made? The painters were thinking that they do not know about the reward. But if a wonderful painting is not made and the king gets angry, then punishment will definitely be given. Therefore, even the great painters did not come forward. Then one of the boys said, King sir, I want to make your painting. I want to give me twenty-four hours. Now all the big painters were surprised as to what kind of painting this boy will make, and if the king does not like the painting, then he will definitely be punished. The king said, Okay, you make it, and bring it. The next day the boy was going to bring the painting, and the court was completely full. People had come from far and wide to see what kind of painting the boy will make. Now when the boy brought the painting of the king, people were astonished. Everyone started clapping loudly, and when the king saw the painting, he became happy and said that there is no better painting than this in this entire corridor. The king rewarded the boy a lot. Now you must be thinking what kind of painting would he have made of the king who has no eye and no wing. In that picture, the boy had shown the king on a horse. From one side he was showing one wing of the king, and the king was aiming while doing archery. And while aiming, one eye closes, and the boy closed that eye of the king, which the king did not have. In this way, the boy had aimed at the king. While painting the picture, he showed a rider on a horse with one eye closed and one leg only, and such a wonderful painting was made that it is the best painting till date. That boy too had a challenge, a crisis in front of him, but he did not leave positivity. At whatever position in life, whatever you are, whatever you are in, whatever situation you are in, if you never leave positivity, then believe me, you will be able to get it out of the crisis. Conclusion do not leave hope in life, because the one who leaves hope, then life leaves him.
stay positive and happy every moment. With the blessings of God and with the love of your loved ones, with your good and true hard work, do something that the world wants to do like you. Now we will explain to you through our third and last story that how you can move your life forward and achieve success by keeping some things in mind and not telling some things to anyone. So let's start the last story. One day, a farmer came to Buddha and said, Maharaj, I am an ordinary farmer. I produce grains by sowing and plowing and then consume it. But my mother does not get satisfaction from this. I want to do something which produces immortal fruits in my field. Please guide me so that immortal fruits start producing in my field. Hearing this, Buddha smiled and said, Good person, you can surely get the fruit of immortality. But for this, instead of sowing seeds in the field, you will have to sow seeds in your mind. Hearing this, the farmer said in surprise, Prabhu, what are you saying? Can we get fruits by sowing mango seeds? Buddha said, Absolutely it is possible, and the fruits you will get from these seeds will be really simple and amazing, which will make your life successful and show you the path of goodness. The farmer said, Prabhu, then please tell me how can I sow mango seeds in the mother tree? Buddha said, Sow mango seeds in the middle of faith, run the cycle of wisdom, water it with the water of knowledge, and add the fertilizer of humility in it. By this, you will get the fruit of immortality. By eating it, your sorrows will go away and you will experience infinite peace. Hearing about getting the fruit of nectar from Buddha, the farmer's eyes opened. He understood that the fruit of nectar can be obtained only through good thoughts. Gautam Buddha was resting in a garden. Just then, a group of children came and started throwing stones on the tree to make the mangoes fall. A stone hit Buddha's head and blood started flowing from it. Tears came in Buddha's eyes. The children got scared when they saw this. They thought that now Buddha will scold them. The children held his feet and started apologizing to him. One of the children said, We have made a big mistake. Because of me, you got hit by a stone and you started crying. On this, Buddha said, Children, I am sad because you threw stones at the mango tree, and the tree gave you sweet fruits in return, but when I did it, I could only give you water. Once Lord Buddha was going to preach in a village with his followers. Before reaching the village, they found many dug pits at various places on the way. One of Buddha's disciples expressed curiosity after seeing those pits. What is the meaning of digging such pits? Buddha said that someone has dug so many pits in search of water. If he would have dug a pit at one place with patience, he would have definitely found water, but he would have dug a pit with some fear, and on not finding water, he would have started digging another pit. A person should have patience along with working hard. Once Lord Buddha reached a farmer's place. Seeing Tathagata coming for alms, the farmer said with expectation, Shravan, I plow the field and then eat. You should also plow the field and sow the seeds and then eat. Buddha said, Maharaj, I also do farming. The farmer got curious and said, Gautam, I have seen your condition. No, no bull and no field of cultivation. Then how do you say that you also do farming? Please explain about your farming. Buddha said, Maharaj, I have the reign of faith, the penance, the plow and field of people, the punishment of sin and bravery, the rope of thoughts, the light fruits and pennies of memory and awareness. I am restrained in words and deeds. I keep this field of mine free from useless grass, and I will keep trying till I reap the harvest of happiness. My bull is immense, which does not turn back even after seeing the challenges. It takes me straight to the abode of peace. This is how I cultivate nectar. Once, Malukia's son asked Buddha, Lord, you have not told me till date what happens after death? Hearing his words, Buddha smiled. Then he asked him, First answer one of my questions. If a person is going somewhere and suddenly a poisonous poison enters his body, what should he do? First, it will be better to remove the poison from the body or see from where it has come and who has been targeted. Malu's son said, First of all, 
the poison that has entered the body should be removed immediately, otherwise it will spread throughout the body. Buddha said, You are absolutely right. Now tell me whether we should first find a way to get rid of the sorrows of this life or think about the things after death. Malu's son had now understood, and his curiosity was satisfied. One day, a person reached Buddha. He was very tensed. Many questions were roaming in his mind and troubling him. Like, what is a soul? Where does a man go after death? Who is the creator of the universe? To what extent is the concept of heaven and hell true, and whether God exists or not? He was not getting answers to these questions. When he reached Buddha, he saw that many people were sitting surrounding Buddha. Buddha was solving all their questions and curiosities very easily. This went on for a long time, but Buddha kept satisfying everyone with determination. The poor man got worried after seeing the situation there. He thought, what is the use of them studying worldly matters? He should do his Bhagwat Bhajan and drive away these people suffering from basic problems. But after seeing Buddha's behavior, it seemed as if the pain of these people was his own pain. At last the man asked, Maharaj, what do you have to do with a button, human sir? Buddha said, I am not a wise man, and I am a human being. Anyway, what is the use of that knowledge which is so arrogant and self-centered that it cannot worry about anyone else except itself? Such knowledge is worse than ignorance. After listening to Buddha's words, the confusion of the man was removed. From that day, both his thinking and behavior changed. The essence of the story is that knowledge is meaningful only when it is used for public welfare. Mahatma Buddha was staying in a village. He used to conduct satsang there every evening. There used to be a crowd of devotees because his sermons gave the right direction to life. There was amazing magic in Buddha's speech. His words used to enter the heart of the listener. A young man used to listen to Buddha's sermons every day. One day when the sermons were over, he went to Buddha and said, Maharaj, I have been listening to your sermons for a long time, but after leaving from here, I am not able to follow the same good conduct in my family life as I hear from here. This also makes me doubt the importance of satsang. Tell me what should I do? Buddha gave a bamboo basket to the young man and asked him to bring water in it. The young man failed to fill the basket with water. Buddha asked him to continue this work. The young man tried to fill the basket with water every day but was not successful. After a few days, Buddha asked him if he noticed any difference in the basket after pouring water in it continuously. The young man said that he definitely noticed a difference. Earlier mud used to accumulate in the basket, but now it looks clean. No dirt is visible, and its holes are not as big as before, they have become very small. Then Buddha explained to him, If you keep pouring it in water like this, then in a few days these holes will swell and close, and you will be able to fill the basket with water. Similarly, those who do satsang continuously, their mind definitely becomes pure one day. Now the holes of guna start getting filled and guna starts filling with water. The young man got a solution to his problem from Buddha. Even wicked people become good by continuous satsang. Because the holy words of great men remove their mental disorders and spread the light of good thoughts in them. Buddha suggested to a man that you bring water from far away. Why don't you dig a well near your house? You will get rid of the water problem forever. Taking the advice, the man started digging the well, but after digging seven to eight feet, he did not find water, let alone a wet soil. He left that place and started digging at another place, but even after digging ten feet, there was no water. He then started digging a well at the third place, but here also he was disappointed. In this sequence, he dug ten wells of 08 ten feet, but water was not found anywhere. Disappointed, he went to Buddha. He told Buddha that I dug ten wells, but water was not found in even one. Buddha was surprised. He himself came to the place where he had dug ten pits. Buddha saw the depth of those pits and understood the whole matter. Then he said that instead of digging ten wells, if you had put all your efforts in one well, you would have found water long ago. You close all the pits. 
just keep digging one, water will come out. He did the same by listening to Buddha. As a result, as soon as the well was full, water came out. Everyone hailed Lord Buddha. Donna Seth had enough money to feed seven generations. His business was spread all over, but still his mind was restless. Sometimes he was worried about the safety of his money and sometimes about getting ahead in business competition. Due to worry and stress, he started becoming unwell. His friend noticed his deteriorating condition and advised him to go to Buddha. Seth went to Buddha and told him his problem. Buddha consoled him and said, Don't worry, your pain will definitely go away. Just stay here for a few days and meditate. As per Buddha's advice, Seth started meditating daily. But the Seth's mind was not focused on meditation. As soon as he sat down to meditate, his mind would again go back to his own world. He told this to Buddha, but B, the merchant's wisdom vanished with these words of Buddha, and he took the path of a pure heart. Determination is essential to get rid of one's bad habits. Until a person makes a firm resolve, he cannot get rid of his bad habits. A young man came to Buddha and said, My village is educated. I have been able to study a little bit after fighting with my family. I want to study further, but everyone is stopping me. My family members think that there is a lot of money in farming and no education is needed for it. The villagers also think the same. Please come to my village and spread education there. Buddha agreed to the young man's words and went to the village. The religious fearing villagers welcomed Buddha and started coming to listen to his sermons every day. Whenever Buddha explained the importance of education, the villagers had a opposing opinion. One day, a woman started asking about her five-year-old child. At what age should he be given education? Then Buddha explained that you should have started his education five years ago. What should he eat? How should he go? What should he say? All the villagers, including women, understood Buddha's words and started sending their children to school. It was rainy season. The young man told people the technique of water harvesting. Most of them made fun of him, but the young man kept doing his work. He had Buddha's support, so no one openly opposed him. When the crops started drying up due to severe water crisis in summer, the young man got wells dug in, which a lot of water came out due to his technique of water harvesting. The villagers had now understood the importance of education. Slowly, the entire village became educated. Knowledge can be acquired at any age. This knowledge gives us the way to solve the problems that come in life. Amrapali was the historically famous Lichchavi royal dancer of the Vraj Sang of Vaishali in the Buddhist period. One of her names is Ambapali or Ambapali. Amrapali was extremely beautiful, and it is said that whoever saw her once would get enchanted by her. Azad Shatru was one of her lovers, and in the literature available at that time, Azad's father Bimbisara is also said to have been her lover secretly. Many poems, plays, and novels have been written in Indian languages about Amrapali. Once upon a time, Mahatma Buddha reached the city of Vaishali while roaming with his disciples. At that time, Vaishali was considered an important district among the sixteen Mahajanapadas, whose fame had spread far and wide. This city was extremely glorious and prosperous from all sides. It did not take long for the news of Mahatma Buddha's arrival to spread in the entire city. Whoever came to know of it would reach to meet him and consider himself lucky after listening to his sermons. Buddha's character was so impressive that no one could remain unimpressed by him. The courtesan and royal dancer of the city, Amrapali, was also keen to meet Buddha. She herself came to Mahatma Buddha and invited him to her house for worship. She requested Buddha with such simplicity and love that Buddha could not refuse. When his disciples came to know that Mahatma Buddha has accepted the invitation of a courtesan, everyone opposed it. Mahatma Buddha very simply told his disciples that I saw her love. The feeling with which she has called me was absolutely pure and pure. She had come to meet me today, not as a courtesan, but with a feeling of devotion. Then how could I not accept her invitation? 
whether she is a prostitute or a monk, Buddha went to Amrapali's house for food at the right time. She had already made all the arrangements for food and was waiting for Lord Buddha to come. There was also a thought in the mind that Buddha might go back on his word. Why would such a great monk come to a prostitute's house and eat? But as soon as Amrapali came, when Buddha saw her coming to her house, her happiness knew no bounds. She ran to the door and welcomed him. She served him food with her own hands and welcomed him. Mahatma Buddha's disciples, who had come with him, when a prostitute, at whose feet even the emperor and the free world were all enemies, the whole of Vaishali longed to have a glimpse of her. Seeing her behave like this with a monk, Buddha's disciples' respect for their guru increased even more. Amrapali was more impressed by what she had heard about Mahatma Buddha's personality. After meeting him, she went to seek refuge in Buddha. She donated all her property to the Buddhist monastery and became a lifelong nun. It is a very old story. Gautam Buddha was living in a city. Some of his disciples were also with him. One day, his disciples went out for a walk in the city. The people of the city abused them a lot. The disciples felt very bad and returned. When Gautam Buddha saw that all his disciples were looking very angry, he asked, What is the matter? Why do you all look so tense? Then one disciple said in anger, We should leave from here immediately. When we went out for a walk in the city, the people here abused us a lot without any reason. We should not stay even for a moment where we are not respected. The people here do not know anything except misbehaving. Gautam Buddha said smilingly, Do you always expect good behavior in any other place? The second disciple said, There must be good people in this city. Then Gautam Buddha said, It would be wrong to leave a place just because the people there misbehave. We are saints. We should do something such that Jains should not leave that place till the time we try to reform the people there with our goodness. We should return only after doing some good to the people there. How long will they behave badly after our good behavior? Ultimately, they will have to be reformed. In reality, the work of saints is to reform such people. The real challenge is when we can prove ourselves in adverse circumstances. Hearing all this, Buddha's favorite disciple Anand asked a question. Buddha answered, Who is called an excellent person? Just as an elephant moving forward in a war keeps moving forward despite facing arrows from all sides, in the same way, an excellent person keeps doing his work while bearing the abuses of others. No one can be better than a person who controls himself. The disciples understood Gautam Buddha's words very well and gave up their intention of leaving from there. Once Prince Abhai asked Gautam Buddha whether Shravan Gautam ever says harsh words. He had thought that he says such words if he says no. He had thought that he says such words if he does not eat. He told that once he had said that Devadatta will go to hell, and if he says yes, then he can be asked that, when you cannot stop yourself from using harsh words, then how do you preach such things to others? Buddha understood the meaning of Abhay's question and said that this can neither be answered in yes nor in no. At that time, there was a small child in Abhay's lap. Pointing towards him, Buddha asked, Prince, if this child unknowingly puts a piece of knife in his mouth, then what will you do? I will try to take it out if he cannot take it out easily. Then holding his head with the left hand, I will take it out by bending the finger of the right hand. If blood starts coming out, then also my effort will be to take out the piece of knife in some way or the other. This is because I have compassion for the child. Prince, in the same way, if Tathagata knows that a word is false or harmful and hurts the heart of others, then he never utters it. But in the same way, he always utters the words that seem true and beneficial to him and which are liked by others. The reason for this is that Tathagata has compassion for all living beings. Once, while going out of Vaishali to preach Dhamma, Gautam Buddha saw that some soldiers were chasing a girl who was running very fast. That girl stood near a well. She was sleeping and was thirsty too. Buddha called that girl near him and asked her to draw water for him from the well. He drank it himself and also made them drink it. In the meantime, 
The soldiers also reached there. Buddha asked the soldiers to stop with a hand signal. On hearing this, the girl said shyly, Maharaj, I am an untouchable girl. If water is taken out of my well, the water will get contaminated. Buddha then said to her, Daughter, I am very thirsty. First you give me water to drink. Meanwhile, the king of Vaishali also reached there. He bowed to Buddha and offered him fragrant water of cuda and rose in a golden vessel. Buddha refused to take it. Buddha once again told his story to the girl. This time the girl gathered courage and took out water from the well and made Gautam Buddha drink it as well. After drinking the water, Buddha asked the girl the reason for her brother. The girl said, By chance I got an opportunity to sing in the king's court. The king rewarded me with my song, but someone told him that I am an untouchable girl. On knowing this, he ordered his soldiers to put me in prison. I somehow managed to escape from them and reached here. On this, Buddha said, Listen, king, this girl is not untouchable. You are untouchable. You enjoyed the song coming from the sweet throat of the girl and rewarded her. She cannot be untouchable. That king could only be ashamed in front of Gautam Buddha. Lord Buddha had scriptures of gods and humans, but first of all, he was a human. Man grows up to become a god. This was an ancient belief. Even today we talk about divinity over humanity. But Buddha reversed this order. He said, this humanity is called the attainment of salvation by gods. When a god attains salvation, he becomes a human. Gods have luxury. There is also attachment, hatred, jealousy, and attachment. Nirvana cannot be attained there. For this, the gods have to become humans. It is among humans that the divine man emerges, whom the gods salute. Buddha, who preaches humanity, himself stood for humanity while living. Here, Incidents related to his life are given, which show the deep humanity present in his personality. God is about to attain nirvana. It is late night. The monks are sitting around his disciple. Buddha is preaching to them. He is saying, Monks, if you have any doubt about Buddha religion and Sangha, ask them. Do not regret later that God was in front of us. But we could ask him anything. No disciple speaks. God says three times, but no monk raises his hand to ask. God doubts whether he is hesitating to ask because of his pride. That is why he says, Monks, perhaps you are not asking because of my pride. Just as a friend asks a friend, you ask me in the same way. Buddha comes to the same role as his disciples. This humility of his is the foundation of human religion. Buddha called himself the well-wisher of the monks, which indicates his humanitarian help and humility. Another scene is also of this time. Buddha had his last meal at Chand Karmar's son's place. After that, he got a severe bleeding disease which caused his intestines to break. Buddha was very concerned about his heart. The devotee could have regretted that the Lord left his body after eating his food. Therefore, before taking his last breath, he ordered Anand to remove this worry of Chand Karmar's son and tell him that Ayushma'an, you have earned a great benefit that Tathagata attained nirvana by eating my food. He was compassionate. Why didn't he say so on the night Buddha attained nirvana? At night, a traveler named Subhadra came. His mother had some doubts. Anand stopped her by saying, Don't surprise him, he is tired. The Lord heard Anand's words. He said to Anand, No, Anand, don't refuse Subhadra. Let her come to me. She wants to ask with the desire of supreme knowledge. She doesn't want to surprise him. On asking whatever I tell her, she will understand it soon. In the middle of the night, Subhadra got the good fortune of listening to the sermon of Tathagata. She was a very sad woman. Her husband, son, and family had all been destroyed. She had gone mad because of her grief. She was not even conscious of wearing clothes. Her name and address were four. One day while roaming, she went to Buddha in Jayatvan rest house. Seeing the naked woman, people said that she is mad. Don't let her come here. Buddha said, don't stop her. As soon as she came near, Buddha said, Sister, 
regain your memory. The woman regained some consciousness. People put clothes on her which she wore. The woman started crying bitterly. Buddha dispelled her grief with his Amrit preaching. Buddha had a monk disciple named Wakt Ali. He once went to the ashram. He conveyed his desire of seeing God to him through one of his fellow monks. God went to him to fulfill his wish. Seeing God coming from a distance, Wakt Kali tried to get up from the bed to respect him and offer him a seat. God stopped him by saying that a separate seat is ready. There is no need for him to move, and he sat on the spread seat. Wakt Ali, while praying to him, said, I had a great desire of seeing you. You have kindly given me a seat. Buddha completed it and said in a soft voice, Vaktali, calm down. Your body is as dirty as mine, Vaktali. What is the benefit of looking at this dirty body? The one who sees religion sees me. The one who sees me sees religion. Lord Buddha had great sympathy for the suffering. Once a woman named Supravasa was about to give birth to a child, and she was suffering from immense pain. She got her husband to offer obeisance at the feet of Buddha. The Lord blessed her and said, May your daughter Supravasa be happy. May she be well, may she be happy and healthy, and may she deliver a son without any pain. He had full sympathy with the living beings as well, just as he had full sympathy with all the creatures of the world. When a disciple of a Brahmin named Bhavri offered obeisance at the feet of the Lord on behalf of his guru, the Lord blessed him and said, May Bhavri Brahmin along with his disciples be happy. Mandavak, you too be happy and live long. Whoever went to Buddha, young or old, he used to say to them, Come, you are welcome. Lord was going to the beach of Nara on his last journey, Pawan and Kushi. On the way, he met a trader named Pukushmal's son. He gifted him a dupata, but how could Lord come alone? He wanted to honor his disciple Anand. He said, Pukush, cover me with one part of the dupata and give the other to Anand. Pukush did the same. Buddha's compassion towards those who made mistakes knew no bounds. Once a Brahmin invited Lord to stay in Viranja for the rainy season. Lord went there, but that Brahmin was a big businessman and did not pay any attention to him. Buddha suffered a lot. He had to eat leftovers every day for three months because there was a famine in Viranja at that time, and that too he and his disciples got from horse traders. Despite all this, at the end of the rainy season, Lord Buddha did not forget to go to Viranja and bless the Brahmin before going elsewhere. There are countless such incidents in Lord Buddha's life. We get a glimpse of his humanity in them. There was the pinnacle of tenderness in his life, and there was a unique sweetness in his speech which attracted everyone towards him. An angry word never came out of his mouth. He was a human being. But he had risen above the weaknesses of man. The auspicious light of humanity shone in his personality as the state of religion. Mahatma Buddha once passed through a village. Some people there were hostile towards him. They stopped him on the way and started abusing and insulting him. Buddha kept listening. When he went there, he said, If you have finished your work, I should go. Those people were very surprised. They said, We abused you. Why don't you get angry? Buddha said, you were late. If you had come ten years ago, I would have also abused you. You can abuse me, but now I am capable of taking abuses. Just giving is not enough. One needs someone to take it too. When I was first taken out of the village, the people there had brought sweets as gifts, but I did not take them because my stomach was full. They took them back. Buddha paused for a while and said, What would the people who took the sweets do with them? One person said, they must have distributed them among their children, family, and loved ones. Buddha said, I did not take the abuses that you took. Will you distribute these also among your family and loved ones? All the opponents of Buddha were ashamed, and they became disciples of Buddha. Once Mahatma Buddha went to a village. There a woman asked him that you look like a prince. Why have you worn saffron clothes in your youth? Buddha replied that I have taken sannyas to find the solution of three questions. Buddha said that our body is young and attractive, but it will grow old, then fall ill, and finally it will die. 
I have to gain knowledge about the cause of old age, illness, and death. Hearing Buddha's words, the woman was very impressed, and she invited him for food. As soon as the people of the village came to know about this, everyone told Buddha not to go to that woman's house, because that woman is characterless. Buddha asked the village head if this is true. The head also agreed with the people of the village. Then Buddha held one hand of the head and said that now show me by clapping. On this the head said that this is impossible, one hand cannot clap. Buddha said that in the same way a woman alone cannot be characterless. If the men of this village were not characterless, then that woman would also not have been characterless. All the men of the village got embarrassed after hearing this from Buddha. Lord Gautam Buddha used to teach his disciples through some medium or the other. Once when Mahatma Buddha was teaching his disciples, he took a rope in his hand and tied many knots in it. After that, Mahatma Buddha happily asked the disciples present there whether this rope is the same as it was before tying knots. One disciple answered Mahatma Buddha's question and said that Guruji, if seen from one point of view, this rope is the same as it was before. But if seen from another point of view, three knots have been tied in the rope. Therefore, its appearance has changed a bit. But it is also true that though its appearance has changed from outside, but from inside, it is basically the same as before. Mahatma Buddha was satisfied after hearing the disciples' answer. After that, Mahatma Buddha said, I will open these knots of the rope. Mahatma Buddha started pulling both ends of the rope with full force, then he asked the disciples whether this will open the knots. The disciple replied, No, no, this will make the knots even tighter. Hearing this, Mahatma Buddha again asked a question, What should be the solution to open these knots? The disciple immediately said, Guruji, we should look at these knots carefully to see how the knots have been tied. After that, we should try to open them. On hearing the disciple's answer, Mahatma Buddha smiled and said that this is the principle of life that I want you people to understand. Whenever you are stuck in a problem in life, first find the cause of the problem and then solve it. In practical life, people try to find a solution without knowing the cause of the problem. Because of this, they do not get the right result. Mahatma Buddha started telling the disciple that many people ask me how to end anger, but no one has ever asked why I get angry. Similarly, people ask me how to end ego, but no one tries to know how the ego was created in them. Just like after tying knots in a rope, its real form does not change. Similarly, no matter what kind of defects are created in a person, the goodness inside him never ends. Just like we can open the structure of a rope by looking at it carefully with patience, similarly we can find a solution to the disorders and problems that come in life. If any kind of problem has arisen in life, then by carefully understanding its cause, its solution also starts coming automatically. The progress that is happening in the world, or if someone progresses in the country, it should definitely be seen, whether it is a domestic team or one made by outsiders, wherever good groups were formed, there was progress. This is what... There was a family that was poor. They had nothing to eat. They tried hard to find work, but could not find any. They had two children and a wife. One day, they thought that it was difficult to find work in this village. Let's go somewhere else. With this intention, one day they left the village. It was nighttime. The road was also in a jungle. They thought of spending the night under a tree. The man sent one of his sons to collect wood and another to fetch water and asked his wife to make a stove, and she cleaned the place. All four of them did their work. The stove was lit and water started to run out. The swan that lived on the tree started thinking, What a fool he is. He has lit the stove, but he has nothing to cook. The swan asked him, What do you have to cook? The man said, We will kill you and eat you. The swan said, Why will you kill me? The man said, We have neither money nor society, so what should we do? The swan got into thinking. He has also lit the stove. Everyone is hardworking. They will eat me anyway. The swan said, If I give you money, will you let me go? The owner of the house said, Yes, I will let you go. 
The swan said, Come with me, I will give you money. The swan took them a little far and signaled with a spear and said, Take it out from here. They dug a pit and took out the money from there. After thanking the swan, they came back to their village and started living happily in a single day. Now there was no shortage of anything in their house. The neighbor saw what this family had that they had so much. He called the younger son and asked him where the money came from. They also had two children. They also made a plan and left. They camped under the same tree. The man asked his elder son to bring wood and the younger son to bring water. But both started making excuses. The wife also said that she was tired. As the wood was collected and the water started heating up, the swan came again and said, You don't have anything to eat, so why are you heating water? The man said, We will kill you and eat you. The swan smiled and said, Those who wanted to kill had come three days ago. Don't waste your time. Go home. Why will you kill me? You are fighting among yourselves. Those who win over others don't fight themselves. The rule of the world is also like this. Those who want to progress, move together, and even today, they are the ones who have the upper hand in the world. Those who live in harmony with each other can only win the swan of society. Once Akbar asked Birbal to show him God. Birbal was very worried about how to show God to the king. With this thought, Birbal went on leave and started feeling sad. One day there was a discussion in the family. When asked the reason for his sadness, Birbal told that the king wanted to see God. Birbal's son said, Take me along tomorrow morning. I will show the king my own darshan. The next day, Birbal and his son reached the court and told the king, My son will solve your question. The king thought, What solution will this boy give? The boy said, At this time, I am your guru. I should be given a proper place. The king thought that he is saying the right thing. I have asked a question. The one who solves is like a guru. The king gave the boy a slightly higher place with him. The boy said, Maharaj, get a bowl of milk. The king asked for a bowl of milk. The boy said, Your Highness, there is a cow in this milk. The king said, Yes, there is. The boy said, First you let me see it. The king said, you are a fool. Cow is not seen like this. First the milk has to be thawed, then its curd has to be set, then it is kept in a mortar, then butter comes out, then it is put in a gum-gum pan, then its pulp is taken out, only then the cow can be seen. Cow is not seen like this. The boy said, this is the answer to your question. First a person has to suffer, then he has to settle down, then he has to do sadhana. Then he has to suffer in the fire of knowledge, and then he gets the darshan of God. Akbar understood and said, You are really my guru. One has to do a lot to know God. By the way, every soul has a part of God, and that should be considered as the form of God. Only then happiness is attained. This is also a rule of the world. A child was not even two years old when his father died. In such a difficult situation, his mother started living with him in her maternal home. Everyone used to call him Nanha. The small statured child was physically weak, but mentally he was very intelligent, and he used to accept with great attention whatever was said or taught to him. Slowly, the days passed, and the boy turned six years old. Once he went to a garden with some of his friends to pluck flowers. The boy and all his friends started plucking fruits. Just then, the gardener came, and all his friends ran away, but he was caught by the gardener. The gardener started beating him with a stick. The boy kept getting beaten, and then said to the gardener in a low voice, My father is not in this world. That is why you are beating me like this. Hearing the boy's words, the gardener stopped his hands. The gardener calmed down and said, Son, because of your father's absence, your responsibility increases even more that you should not do anything wrong. Hearing this, the boy started crying bitterly and resolved never to wish for anything wrong. This same boy grew up and became famous by the name of Lal Bahadur Shastri, and as a prime minister, he got praise everywhere for his qualities and behavior. The essence of the story 
is that in the absence of valuable guidance from parents, one should become more responsible and develop oneself. There is an incident from the 19th century. In a village named Veer Singh in Medinapur district, a mother lived with her son. The mother's lifestyle was very simple and her thoughts were very high. She always gave cultured education to her son. The son was also obedient to the mother. The mother was bringing up the son with great struggle. The son saw and understood his mother's sufferings, and for this reason, he had a feeling in his mind that when he grows up, he should give all kinds of happiness to his mother. One day, the son said to his mother, I have a great desire to get something made for you. You do not have a single jewel. On hearing this, the mother said, Son, I have been wanting three types of jewels for a long time. The son asked, What jewels are those? The mother replied, Son, there is no school in this village. You get a good school built, open a medicine shop, make arrangements for the stay and food of poor and orphan children. This will be like jewels for me. On hearing his mother's words, the son started crying. The son was Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, and the mother was Bhagwati Devi. Bhagwati Vidyalaya established by this son in Veer Singh village. Even today, the story of those priceless jewels is being told. The essence of the story is that the desire to beautify the society more than to beautify oneself gives man humanity, and a society full of such humanity makes the idea of a 100 Sanskrit nation a reality. A Mahatma was very knowledgeable. He often used to tell his disciples the good things from the Ramayana, Mahabharata, and Gita texts and urged them to follow them in their conduct. Every evening he used to preach and try to awaken good conduct in the listeners by narrating stories and examples from these religious scriptures. Mahatma Ji's own conduct was also similar. He used to eat roots and tubers and never desired anything. He was never interested in collecting wealth. If any disciple or listener presented something to him with devotion, he would immediately donate it to a needy person. After the sermon, Mahatma Ji used to solve the questions and queries of the people. He used to talk about learning from the Ramayana, etc. One day, a person asked him, Mahatma Ji, should Ramayana be considered right or wrong? He replied, Son, when Ramayana was composed, I was not there. Even when Ramji was meditating in the forest, my whereabouts were not known. Therefore, I cannot tell whether Ramayana is right or wrong. I can only tell that by studying it and improving myself by learning from it, I am in the position I am in today. If you want, you can also make your life better by using it. The essence is that religious scriptures and ethics are not the subject of salvation. They contain the elements of a satmuki life. Therefore, use them to make your life meaningful. They should get education of the book rather than judge them on the basis of Tarak. Novel card Clonin was very poor. The publishers would either grab the royalty of the books or give Chronic less than his due. Chronic was very simple. He did not know how to fight with the publishers and get his due, so he was living his life in poverty. Somehow, he completed his medical studies in this poverty and became a doctor. When he came into the medical field, some people told him the way to earn money through it. He got influenced by the people and started charging hefty fees from the patients. He does not show mercy on any person and takes medical expenses in advance. Seeing this, Cronin's wife became very sad. She was very compassionate. Seeing her husband being so cruel to the poor, one day she said, It was better if we were poor, but we had less compassion in our hearts. Losing that compassion, we became poor and now we are no longer human beings. Hearing his wife's heart-touching words, Dr. Cornyn got an enlightenment, and he said to his wife, You are saying the truth. A person is rich not by money, but by his mind. You showed the right thing at the right time, otherwise we would have fallen into the deep ditch of inhumanity and would never have been able to get up. The implication of the story is that when a man starts to falter from his basic identity of humanity, not only does social morality break down, but he himself also becomes hollow from within, because this happens only after he loses his sacred, cultured streak.
Buddhism had been widely propagated. Many Buddhist monasteries had been established. A capable Acharya Kalpit was to be appointed in all the monasteries so that he could play an important role in the proper propagation of Buddhism. In the appointment of Acharya and Vice-Chancellor, apart from their knowledge and wisdom, their interest in the welfare of others was also specially tested, because the monastery gave importance to collective interests. For a big Buddhist monastery, the appointment of a capable vice-chancellor was a matter of discussion in those days. The acharya of that Buddhist monastery was Danimod Kalyan, who was full of knowledge and wisdom. There were three candidates for the post of vice-chancellor, and all three were capable. But only one had to be chosen. So, to test all three, all three were sent to the forest. Acharya Mount Kalyan reached the forest beforehand to test them. He placed thorns on the path. By evening, all three candidates had reached there. Seeing the thorns on the path, all three stopped. One thought something and changed his path. The second jumped over the thorns and crossed the path. The third started removing the thorns from the path so that the path becomes free of obstacles for others. Acharya Modak Kalyan saw this secretly. Seeing all this, Acharya Mount Kalyan declared this third candidate to be imaginary, saying that only the one who can take care of everyone and has the ability to inspire with his conduct can establish the tradition of good tendencies in the monastery. The essence of the story is that only the one who gives priority to collective interests over personal interests is a true leader. A guru and his disciple were going for pilgrimage. When evening fell while walking, both of them stopped for night rest under a tree. Guruji used to sleep only for three to four hours at night, so his sleep ended quickly. Without waking up his disciple, he finished his daily chores and started praying. In the meantime, he saw a huge snake going towards his disciple. Since Guruji understood the language of animals and birds, he asked the snake, What is the purpose of biting my sleeping disciple? The snake replied, Mahatma, your disciple had killed me in my previous life. I have to take revenge from him. I have got the form of a snake because of my untimely death. I will kill your disciple and give him an untimely death. After thinking for a moment, Guruji said, My disciple is very virtuous and promising and is also a good sadhak. Then why are you killing him and depriving the world of his knowledge and talent? You yourself will not get salvation from this work. But the snake did not change its resolve. Then Guruji put forward a proposal and said, My disciple's sadhana is still incomplete. He still has to do a lot in this field, while my goals have been accomplished. I have no intention of harming anyone. So take ten from me in place of him. Seeing this affection of the guru, the heart of the snake changed, and he bowed to him and went away from there. In fact, the greatness of the guru lies not only in imparting knowledge to the disciple, but also in protecting him till he is fully matured. Swami Vivekananda's sermons were full of knowledge and logic. Swamiji used to solve the most complex questions related to knowledge, devotion, and karma with his natural intelligence. There was always a crowd of curious people around him. During the sermon, or even after the sermon was over, it used to happen many times that questions kept coming from the side of Jijans, and Swamiji would give satisfactory answers to those questions. Once Swamiji was explaining the importance of God's name in his sermon, hearing this, a person argued, Swami G, what is the point of words? What is the benefit of memorizing them? Then Swami G addressed him with abusive words like ignorant, fool, etc., with the aim of explaining him with evidence. On hearing this, he got very angry and said that such words do not suit a sannyasi like you. His mouth has been hurt a lot by your words. Then Swami G said, Brother, those are words with syllables. You yourself said what is there in words. I also said only syllables to you. I did not want anyone to throw stones at me. On hearing Swamiji's words, that person got the answer to his question, that if words can anger you, then sweet words can also get blessings and grace. In fact, 
The glory of words is limitless. Unpleasant words pierce the heart, and sweet words act as a balm. Therefore, in the first case, practice is done, and in the second case, respect and blessings are obtained. Three friends lived happily in a place, a tortoise, a deer, and a crow. All kinds of animals and birds also lived in the forest, but there was no one like them. One day the deer said, Hey, I have become old by sitting there. Let's play a game in which everyone can have fun. The tortoise and the crow said, Yes, friends, we have become old by playing the same game of sitting there. Now we will play a new game. The deer said to the crow, Okay, then you sit on a big tree, close your eyes, and count the knocks, and we both will hide. After that, you search for us. The first friend you see while searching will count the knocks in your place, and you hide. The crow started counting. The deer and the tortoise started hiding. The game continued like this. When the three friends got tired of playing, they sat down and started talking. Meanwhile, a hunter was passing by. Then his eyes fell on the deer, crow, and tortoise. As soon as the hunter saw the three friends, he ran to catch them. Sensing the danger, the deer and the well fled from there. The tortoise sensed it, but due to the slow speed of the tortoise, it got caught by the hunter, and the hunter tied it in his clothes and started taking it away. The hunter became happy in his heart that if not the deer, then even if it is the tortoise, at least the night's arrangements have been made. Saying this, he started leaving from there. On the other hand, the deer and the crow started feeling sad seeing their friend in the captivity of such a hunter. At that time, the hunter was going to eat the tortoise for dinner. Hearing this, the deer and the crow made a plan. The crow told the deer that as soon as the hunter starts leaving from here, then you go in front of him. When the hunter sees you, he will put his bundle on the ground and run to catch you. I will fly away, holding the bundle kept on the ground, and you run away from there. As soon as the hunter started leaving from there, the deer came in front of him. As soon as the hunter put the bundle on the ground to catch the deer, the crow flew away, holding the bundle in its beak. The hunter ran to catch the deer and looked back at the crow. The crow was flying, holding the bundle in its beak, and the deer ran away in a blink of an eye. The hunter returned home disappointed. The crow kept the bundle in a safe place and freed the crow from the clutches of the hunter, and the three friends started living happily. From this, we learn that the real friendship is only that which is true. There was a farmer who had two sons who were very lazy and useless. Instead of helping their father in the work, they used to be lazy and roam around here and there. The farmer was very worried about his sons. He used to think, what will happen to them after my death? How will they feed themselves? How will they take care of their family? One day the condition of the farmer was very serious, that is to say, the farmer was in a dying condition. Then the farmer called both his sons and told them that there is a treasure buried in our field. But I don't even know where it is. But after digging you will find that treasure. Saying this, the farmer passed away. Hearing the news of the treasure, both the sons got greedy, and they both went to the field and started digging the field. After digging the entire field in greed of the treasure, they went home and sat down and started cursing their father. In this way, a few months passed and the rainy season arrived. The farmer's sons had only one way to fill their stomachs. That was farming. Then, like everyone else, the farmer's sons started sowing seeds in the field. After getting rainwater, the seeds sprouted, and soon the field started waving. It seemed as if they were waving with the gust of wind. Seeing this, the farmer's sons became very happy. They understood that hard work is the real wealth, and in this way they also understood the meaning of their father's words and started working. This is the story of all of us today. Friends, our parents are also like this tree. When we are small, we grow up by playing with them, and when we grow up, we leave them and come back only when we need them. Slowly, life passes like this. We should serve our parents in the form of trees and not just take advantage of them. In this story, 
we see that the child was very important for the tree, and the child used the tree as per his need again and again, knowing that he was only using it. Similarly, nowadays we also use our parents as per our need and forget them when we grow up. We should always serve our parents, respect them, and no matter how busy we are, we should always take out some time for them. Once upon a time, Gautam Buddha was sitting with his disciples. Then a person came there who was very angry, and he came to Gautam Buddha and started abusing him. Gautam Buddha's disciples got very angry, but Gautam Buddha was very calm. That person left from there. Then the next day he came again, and today he was even more angry, and started abusing Gautam Buddha even more. But even today Gautam Buddha was very calm and was smiling, but Gautam Buddha's disciples got very angry. That person kept shouting for some time and then went away. The next day that person came again, and today he crossed all limits. He came and started abusing Gautam Buddha. Gautam Buddha's disciples got very angry, but even today Gautam Buddha was very calm. All this kept happening, and Buddha was smiling. This sequence continued for a few days, and then that person stopped coming. Then one of his disciples asked, Guruji, if you wanted, you could have chased that person away on the first day itself. But why didn't you do that? Then Gautam Buddha said very politely, If a person gives us a gift and we refuse to accept it, what will that person do? The disciple said that the person will return with his gift. Then Gautam Buddha said, I also did the same thing. That person gave me a gift in the form of abuses. I refused to accept it, meaning I did not react to it. Then the person took back his abuses and returned. A man had a three-year-old daughter. One day that person saw that his daughter was wrapping a box with a very beautiful and expensive gold packing paper. Seeing this, that person got very angry. He scolded his daughter a lot. You wasted my precious paper. That too, without any reason, it would have been good if you had used it for good work but you wrapped a useless box in it. A few days passed. Diwali day came. That man gave a gift to his daughter. The daughter also gave the same beautiful golden box to her father. Her father was very happy to see it at first, but as soon as he opened the box, it was empty. Seeing this, the man glared at his daughter and said, Don't you even know that we don't give empty boxes to anyone? The girl remained quiet for some time, then said, "Papa." This box is not empty. I have kept a lot of cases in it for you. Sometimes you go to office early and I stay asleep. Then you can take one of these. The man's eyes filled with tears after listening to his daughter. A boy lived in a village. The financial condition of his house was not good. His mother thought that he should go to a big city and do a job. He went to Kolkata and started searching for a job. After a lot of search, he got a job in a businessman's house. The job was for six annas a day. It was less. The businessman had to listen to newspapers and books for six hours every day. The boy got the job. There was a need, so he accepted the job. One day the boy found 800 rupee notes lying in a corner of the shop. He quietly covered them with newspapers and books. The next day, the boy was searched for the money. When he came to the shop in the morning, he was asked about the money. The boy immediately took out the money and gave it to the customer. He was very happy. Everyone was very happy with the boy's honesty. The businessman was also very happy with the boy. The businessman wanted to give a reward to the boy, but the boy refused to accept it. The boy said, Sethji, I want to study further, but due to lack of money I am not able to study. Please help me a little. The businessman arranged for the boy's education. The boy kept studying very hard. This boy later on became a great literateur. His name was 